In this section, I'm going to cover an introduction to electrochemistry and a review of redox reactions. So um, first we should talk about what electricity is, because uh, as we move forward through this chapter, we're going to start looking at um, how batteries are made. So uh, electricity is the flow of electrons around a circuit from negative to positive. And remember that an electron has a negative charge, so electrons are repelled from the negative terminal of a battery, and they're attracted to the positive terminal of a battery. So um, on their journey, as the electrons leave the negative electrode and travel toward the positive electrode, we can use that movement of electrons to make the electrons do work, and, uh, for example, convert that electrical energy into light energy as they travel through a light bulb. Um, so remember, the difference uh, between heat and work is that uh, when energy is transferred as work, the, uh, all of the, um, the energy is transferred in uniform motion. So the electrons are all going the same way. They're all going from negative to positive. So since they're always moving in this defined path, we can use that... Uh, that energy as work, and we can convert it to other forms. So um, on an uh, atomic scale, what's happening is that when an electron is ejected from a battery, for example, um, through a copper wire, then remember the copper wires are made of atoms, maybe these are copper atoms here, and an electron is added to the system, and when this electron is added, then this atom gains a negative charge uh, because there's not enough protons in the nucleus to balance the negative charge that just was added. So that kind of makes the uh, uh, the atom unstable and it ejects electron an electron and so an electron moves towards this one and the whole thing happens all over again. Then this atom becomes unstable and it ejects electron this way. So the reason that um, the electrons are always kind of moving in this direction, remember, is because there's a positive electrode over here, and the electrons kind of feel a pull toward that positive electrode. So, um, remember, work or energy can be converted between different forms. So, here um, in a generator, the way a generator works is um, an engine. Uh, maybe gasoline or something, right, is used to turn um, a uh, coiled copper wire to make it spin in a circle inside uh, of a cylinder of magnets. And when wire is spun, coiled wire is spun in a circle in this uh, coil of magnets like this, then that creates an electrical flow, um, an electrical current. So here we can see that um, maybe the energy in the gasoline, which is chemical energy, is converted to um, a mechanical motion, a spinning motion. So chemical to mechanical, and then the mechanical spin here as it spins around in um, wire in, inside of these magnets creates electrical energy. So that um, every time the energy is being converted from chemical to mechanical to electrical, it's that's um, being converted as as work, but remember that uh, due to the second law of thermodynamics, each of those energy transfers also requires some of that energy to be lost as heat. So as the um, gasoline is uh, burning, it's, it's obviously releasing heat. As it spins this around, there's some friction and that's creating heat. Um, as the electricity moves through the wires, there's some resistance in the wire and that creates some heat. So those are all uh, uh, losses of that energy so that it's not 100% efficient and that is going to increase the entropy. So what we'll be looking at a lot in this chapter is the conversion of chemical energy to electrical energy. So um, remember that chemical energy is the energy that's found within chemical bonds. Uh, when we have an exothermic reaction, that means that the bonds that were broken were um, weaker bonds than the bonds that were formed. That means that stronger bonds were formed. In that case, um, the ex that excess energy from the weak bonds to the strong bonds is going to be lost as uh, heat. 
and vice versa. If we take a really strong bond and we make a weak bond out of that, that's going to absorb energy and that would be an endothermic reaction. So when we measure the energy within the chemical bonds, the products and the reactants, we're measuring the chemical energy of, that, of those substances or of that reaction. So um, when we create, uh, when we have a, a system like this, and I have a piece of pure metal here, zinc for example, this can serve as one electrode. Um, and then if this is connected by some kind of conductive wire to another piece of metal over here, copper for example, could be other, these could be other metals. But it's important that it's something that can conduct electricity. So in this setup right here, uh, this is how chemical energy is converted to electrical energy. So the way that it works is we're looking at this reaction down here. This is a chemical reaction. Solid zinc plus uh, dissolved copper 2 plus ions can be converted to zinc 2 plus ions plus solid copper. So notice we have solid zinc over here. There is energy within the bonds of all of these zinc atoms stuck together. And notice we have solid copper on this side and there's energy within the bonds of all of these solid copper atoms stuck together. So during this reaction, if we break it up into half, we can see that the zinc solid is going to zinc 2 plus. So here's that half. Zinc solid goes to zinc 2 plus. That means that it loses two electrons. Because if I add those two electrons back to this zinc 2 plus, then the 2 plus and the 2 minus cancel, and I get zinc without a charge, zinc solid. And conversely, the copper is going from copper 2 plus to copper solid, if we look at that half of the reaction. So here I have dissolved copper 2 plus, plus two electrons, the two plus and the two minus will cancel to give me copper zero, which is solid copper. So here's these two chemical substances and uh, the, other, the other half of those reactions, the zinc two plus, this should say zinc two plus, not zinc two minus. So the zinc two plus is in solution here and the copper two plus is in solution with the solid copper. And so remember, in order for us to put a positive ion into a solution, I can't just make a solution with water and copper 2 plus in it. It has to have plus and minus. Every time an ion is carried into a solution, it has to be carried into a solution by an equivalent number of the oppositely charged ion. So copper 2 plus requires two negative charges. So this must have been added the the maybe the solid that was added to this water to make a solution was copper nitrate. And so one copper two plus and two nitrate minuses. And similarly on this side, the zinc two plus, not minus, the zinc two plus needs to have counter ions. So we are here I have two NO3 minuses to balance the charge on the zinc two plus. So this is the reaction that's occurring. And during this reaction, um, electrons are being transferred and the reason that we know that is because zinc solid is going to zinc 2 plus and it's losing two electrons and copper 2 plus is gaining two electrons to become copper solid so the two electrons that zinc loses are going to copper to create copper solid so I get this overall reaction here so um, the way that we can convert the chemical energy within these bonds during this process the chemical energy from the zinc going to zinc 2 plus and the copper 2 plus going to copper solid is to make the electrons on their journey they leave the zinc and we make them travel through this system here through the copper solid and then they can reach the copper 2 plus and reduce the copper 2 plus to make uh, a solid copper atom so the idea is that if these two solutions were not separated then the electrons could easily flow from the zinc to the copper 2 plus right here because there'd be a bunch of copper 2 plus right here. So the, the electrons would just go beep, right to the copper 2 plus and the reaction would be over. It would be hard to capture that energy. But if I separate the two, uh, the two solutions and the only way the electrons can get from here to here is around this path, then I can capture that electrical energy and make those electrons do something on their way from here to here. So this salt bridge here 
See that the electrons are going this way. They're going from the zinc solid to the copper two plus in, over here in this uh, beaker. So if the electrons are moving this way, then that means that a negative charge is leaving this side and negative charge is building up on this side. So I can't have a buildup of charge. If negative charge builds up on this side and positive charge builds up on this side, then that's going to stop this whole process. Because as soon as I have a negative charge over here, another electron is not going to want to go into a solution that's negative. It's going to be repelled. And as soon as I have a positive charge over here, an electron is not going to want to leave the positive charge. It's going to be attracted. It's going to want to come back. So the, there can't be a buildup of charge or the process stops. So in order to balance the charge, as soon as an electron comes into the solution, a nitrate ion leaves the solution. So one minus comes in, one minus goes out, and that minus comes in here. Oops. And conversely, a negative can go out to balance the charge, the nitrate goes out, and a sodium plus can come in to balance the charge. Or a uh, nitrate can come in from this side to, to add more negative charge to this side, or a Cl minus can come in to this side to add more negative charge to this side. So the salt bridge helps to balance the charge between the two separated solutions. So notice that as the reaction um, moves forward, my solid zinc, the reaction says my solid zinc is being converted to dissolved zinc. So if I start with a zinc electrode that is this width all the way down, as the reaction moves forward, that solid zinc is going to be dissolved and converted into dissolved zinc. Um, and therefore, the electrode will kind of start to deteriorate like this. And conversely, the copper, we can see the copper 2 plus from the solution is gaining two electrons. Copper 2 plus from the solution is gaining two electrons and um, that's turning it into a solid copper ion. So you can see that the two plus ions are becoming solid copper atoms as they uh, attach to this electrode. So that means that a solid copper electrode that's this width all the way down is going to get bigger. Basically the zinc becomes zinc two plus, but copper two plus becomes solid copper. So the copper electrode will get bigger, or the cathode will get bigger. So again, these reactions where electrons are transferred from one species to another species are called oxidation reduction reactions because the species that is losing the electrons is oxidized and the species that is gaining the electrons is reduced. So we have these oxi oxidation reduction reactions always travel in these pairs. Whenever something is oxidized, it means that something else was reduced. So. Um, we, sometimes we call these redox reactions for short. So here's an example. Um, when two solid sodium atoms and two uh, chloride gas, uh, with one, excuse me, one molecule of chloride gas, when um, solid sodium and chloride gas are mixed, they can react to make sodium chloride, Na plus and Cl minus. So that, remember the Na here, when it's solid, it doesn't have a charge, it's Na zero. And when uh, chloride, chlorine is a gas, it has a zero charge. So when the sodium goes from sodium zero to sodium plus, that means it lost one electron. And when the chlorine gas goes from chlorine zero to chlorine minus, that means it gained one electron. And since there are two chlorine atoms, and each chlorine atom gains one electron, that means I need two electrons to reduce both of the chlorine atoms to chloride. So um, oxidation, um, there's a couple of different ways that we can define oxidation uh, depending on the reactions that we're looking at or um, the, the way that we're, we want to um, examine those different processes. For example, sometimes when we're looking at uh, redox reactions from an electrochemistry point of view, it helps to think of this increase in oxidation number. But sometimes when we're thinking about oxidation and reduction reactions from an organic chemistry point of view, it helps to think about the addition or uh, removal of oxygen or the addition or removal of hydrogen. So here's a couple of different ways that we can think about oxidation. 
in oxidation, the oxidation number of an element increases. So it goes from zero to positive, or it goes from negative to less negative, or negative to zero, for example. Um, an element loses electrons. Oxidation is loss of electrons. Compound can gain oxygen. That's also called an oxidation. If a compound loses hydrogen, that's called an oxidation. Um, or a half reaction that has electrons as products, we could define that as an oxidation too. And conversely, um, reduction is when the oxidation number of an element decreases. So it becomes less positive or it becomes more negative. That element gains electrons. Um, it can happen when a compound loses oxygen. We call that a reduction. And if a compound gains hydrogen, that's also called a reduction. And finally, if a half reaction has electrons as reactants, we call that a reduction. So a half reaction, since these um, react, uh, oxidation reduction reactions always travel in pairs, whenever something is oxidized, something is reduced, we could call them redox reactions for short. And that means that they really consist of two half reactions, the reduction half and the oxidation half. So when I look at a redox reaction, this thing here, I can split it into two halves. I can look at the part that was oxidized, and I can look at the part that was reduced. So in order to figure out which part was oxidized and which part was reduced, I have to look at the oxidation numbers of all of the species involved. And remember how to do oxidation numbers. This was way back in chapter four. But there's a series of rules that we use to uh, determine the oxidation number of an element or a compound. So the oxidation number of a pure element is zero. So here's Cl2. There's no other elements. Excuse me. That is uh, an uh, oxidation number of zero. The oxidation number also matches the charge. So here's I minus that has a one charge a minus one charge, so that means that the iodine atom has a negative one oxidation state. Here's H2O. So another rule in oxi um, to determine oxidation numbers is that oxygen is almost always minus two, and hydrogen is almost always plus one when it's in a compound. So here's water. It follows that rule. Oxygen has a minus two oxidation state. Hydrogen has a plus one. Since there's two hydrogens, the plus one is, is plus two, right? And the, there's one oxygen, so minus two. Plus two and minus two equals zero. The charge on a water molecule is zero. Cl minus has an oxidation state of minus one. Um, iodate, IO3 minus. If oxygen has a, an oxidation state of minus two, then I have negative two, negative four, negative six, because there's three oxygens. If this overall compound has a negative one charge, and I have negative six contribution from oxygen, then that means that the, um, the iodine must be plus five, because plus five plus negative six equals negative one, which is the charge on the species. So I use the oxidation numbers of elements that I know, and I use the charge on the species to help me figure out the oxidation number of elements I don't know. And of course, here's H plus with an oxidation state of plus one. So what happened in this reaction? Cl went from zero to minus one. So Cl was reduced. So here's the reduction half reaction. Cl2 gained two electrons and became two Cl minus. Um, what happened to I? I be went from minus one to plus five, so its oxidation number increased, therefore it was oxidized. So I minus, going to iodate, needs six electrons for this to happen. It went from minus one to plus five. That's a change of six. That's six electrons required for that uh, oxidation to occur. So we break, the, um, we break a redox reaction into half reactions to help us analyze what's happening. So to balance redox reactions, there's a series of steps that we have to follow, a series of rules. Number one, we have to assign oxidation states like we just did. We assign oxidation states to all of the atoms in the entire, uh, in the entire reaction. And that helps us analyze which things were reduced, which things were oxidized, and which atoms stayed the same. 
we write, we separate the oxidation and reduction half reactions. Um, and then we write the electrons necessary, like, like we're, we're in that last slide, two electrons for chlorine, six electrons for iodine. Um, and we make sure that we put the electrons on the right side, considering uh, the oxidation and reduction. Reduction electrons are reactants, and oxidation electrons are products. And then we balance the half reactions by mass. So we'll first balance any element that is not H and O. So when we break those half reactions down, we'll look at the elements. And just like we've balanced reactions in the past, we balance them by putting coefficients in front of the compounds to make sure that we have the same number of atoms on each side. And then if I have oxygen and hydrogen that are in that reaction and they are too unbalanced, then instead of just adding oxygen, because sometimes there's not an oxygen on the other side, I have to add H2O as a source of oxygen. And where H is needed, I have to add H plus as a source of hydrogen. So um, finally, depending on whether we're in acidic solution or basic solution, I have to then, uh, if I have H plus, I'm fine because H plus is acidic. But if I'm in basic solution, if the, if the um, problem says balance this reaction in basic solution, then I have another step where I have to neutralize the H plus with OH minus. And uh, we'll go over some examples of these. So um, step four is we balance the half reactions by charge, which we do by adjusting the electrons. We can multiply the entire reaction by um, a number and increase each coefficient by that ratio. Uh, balance the electrons, add the half reactions, and finally we we count the reaction to make sure it's balanced by counting all the atoms on each side and by balancing the total charge on each side to make sure it matches. And if it does, then you've successfully balanced that redox reaction.